Today is uh, unusual because Feast of John the Baptist only occurs on a Sunday about every six years or so. But unlike other saints' days, that which are not celebrated on Sundays, we do observe his particular day. Also, what, another unusual thing is that we generally don't celebrate saints' days on their birthdays. We usually celebrate the saint um, on the day of the person's death, suggesting that that's the day in which the saint entered eternity. But John the Baptist, though, we observe as his major feast, the day of his birth. John is in very elite company because we only celebrate the birthday of two others on our calendar, Jesus himself and uh, the Blessed Mother. So why is John the Baptist in this very elite company? The reason is because John the Baptist was born without original sin. Now, he was not conceived without original sin, but he was born without it because we are told that the Holy Spirit entered into him when he was still in the womb. And church writers have always, and fathers have always considered this to be that when John was born, he was without sin. He was holy from that point when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. John's ministry started when he was yet born. The very first thing he ever did in his life, before he could talk, or before he had even seen the light of day outside of his mother's womb, was to leap inside of her in a way that she had never experienced before. I mean, if you talk to a woman who's having a child or a woman who's had a baby, the mother will always tell you about the child moving within. Well, this this particular case, the word used to describe John's movement inside of his mother was not the word stir or anything of that type, but it was the word used for leaping. It's the same word that was used of King David when he danced before the ark. It's very sad that for many years in our lectionary, it's been corrected, I'm, I'm very grateful. This one must have gotten past the censor, so to speak, but the, the way that the, the visitation was described was Mary visited Elizabeth, and Elizabeth said that the baby stirred in her womb. She said no such thing. She said, as the moment your, greeted, your greeting entered my ear, she was talking with the Blessed Mother, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And using that very strong verb, this allowed the, the mother of John the Baptist to speak words that the baby could not speak. She said to Mary, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? There wasn't any way in the world that Elizabeth would have known that Mary was pregnant at this time. Mary's pregnancy was about 10 days old from conception. Who told her? The Holy Spirit working through her unborn child. The first prophesying then in the New Testament is between women carrying their unborn children. <clears throat> this should call to mind a number of things, one of which is that our vocation or our call to serve God comes to us from the womb. The fact that a person is conceived means that God is calling that individual into life and has a plan for the person. We can pray and we should pray with some regularity, Psalm 139, which you'll find in the Old Testament. Those of you who pray the Liturgy of the Hours, we used it in Mass just a minute ago. <clears throat> We say, Lord, you have probed me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I stand. With all my ways you are familiar. You knew me when I was being fashioned in the depths of the earth, when I was being put together in my mother's womb. 
I am fearfully, wonderfully made. The idea is that whenever we go to pray, we're coming before the ground of our being. God is the ground of our being. Without him, we would not live. Everyone should be eminently grateful for the gift of life. I know life can be difficult, but better to have a difficult life than never to have had one at all. Life is a gift. But we cannot appreciate the gift of life if we do not appreciate God. We must come before him as people who are debtors. We are indebted to him who is the author of life. Our society has become somewhat antenatal, which means that children are not universally accepted or embraced. I know women who've told me that they've been basically made fun of when they've gone out in public, pregnant and whatnot, which is very sad. We should never fall for the line that children are some, somehow a detriment to the world. Some people talk about overpopulation. Now, you can do this at home. You can do the math and figure out that the entire world's population could actually fit into a relatively small area, such as the state of Texas. I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just saying that, it, you know, it, mathematically, it just shows that what we have in the world, we have pockets of very heavily concentrated areas, usually urban, well, urban areas. Yes, there are population issues whenever you have uh, many, many people living on top of each other, as, as it seems that uh, we have so often. But there's plenty of room in the world, and um, we should be mindful that every child in many ways is a sign of hope for the world. The world in many ways is always dying. And we need signs of life. Child reminds us that God is real, that God exists, that he continues working his creation even today. There is no future without children. Mother Teresa once said that to say that there are too many children in the world is like saying there are too many flowers. Who in his right mind would ever make a statement to that effect? Yet there are people, even people teaching in universities, who think that there's something wrong with human beings. There, there isn't. Yes, uh, we, we need to be formed. Uh, yes, we can make a mess of things. This is true. But the basic value of life is still the point that I would like to make. A child who's allowed to develop or grow, will, barring anything unforeseen, such as disease or something, will grow into adulthood and take his or her place in the world. John the Baptist became a very formidable figure in Israel at the time. In fact, he was such an impressive man and he, in his ministry that people thought he was the Messiah. This is why, for example, in the second reading, in the letter, or I should say in the Acts of the Apostles, there is a line in there about John correcting people telling them that he is not the Messiah. There was a great controversy about this. John was uh, a figure of uh, great importance. People were very drawn to him. He was something like a monk, he dressed in uh, rough-hewn, if you will, garments. Uh, he lived out in the desert. He prayed. Uh, he didn't marry. He was celibate, which is a mark of somebody with a special calling special work, special consecration. People were attracted to him and came to him, confessed their sins, and were baptized by him. He was something of an innovator. Any child who comes into the world through conception and birth could innovate any one of a number of things, start some sort of a movement, what have you. John certainly did. And in doing this, he prepared his people for the real Messiah, who was Jesus. Now, John uh, didn't have an easy time with Jesus. I mean, sometimes we look at these stories and we know how they turn out and think everything was fine, but it really wasn't. John himself struggled. I mean, yes, he recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, but it wasn't easy for him to accept because Jesus didn't seem to fit the mold. And the proof of this was that when John was in prison, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah? Tell, tell us so that we can tell John. And Jesus gave a rather enigmatic answer, which was not unusual for him, because he wanted John to think about it. What have you seen and heard? The deaf hear, the dumb speak, the paralyzed walk. 
dead are, the dead are raised, all of these things. That's what Jesus told them. John listened and took it to heart. John pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God. And at every Mass, the priest holds up the host and says, quoting John the Baptist, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Indeed, it is the ministry of the church today to point out Jesus to people who is the Lamb of God. And everybody has a role to play at this point. We all know people who don't know Jesus for one reason or another. We have opportunities to, to, to invite people to open their hearts up to faith. We should take these opportunities seriously. John died a heroic death. In fact, the feast of commemorating his death is August the 29th. It's not a major feast, but it's important enough. John was put into prison because he told the king, who was King Herod, that it was not right for him to live with a woman who, who, was not, who could not legitimately be his wife. She was actually his brother's wife, plus she, she was a niece. So it was an incestuous relationship. The wife's daughter was so upset with John that, that she asked that John's head be delivered on a platter. And there are paintings with this gory detail in it, in them, of John's head being on the silver platter. In fact, that's where the saying in English, in our culture, comes, I'll have your head on a platter. It goes right back to those days when literally it happened. John died then defending the bond of marriage. He died a martyr's death. He died in witness to the truth. Last year on this date, June the 24th, I was in New York. I was on a pilgrimage. While I was there, the New York State Legislature signed into law, or passed into law, I should say. The governor signed it, unfortunately. The law which permitted men to marry men and women to marry women. It's a very sad day in the history of New York and the history of the church in this country, or excuse me, the history of this country, history of government in this country. The, the thing is, I mean, some of the people who were responsible for passing this uh, very illegitimate uh, measure were Catholic people in the legislature. Catholics are supposed to be witnesses to the truth. I mean, we're all supposed to be prophets. Prophets mean people who stand for the truth. Sometimes we need to correct people. John the Baptist did not humiliate Herod. He simply corrected him. He said, it's not right for you to live with this woman. So we live in a world that has lost its sense for the truth. But we have many people in the world who are supposed to be dedicated to the truth. This is one of, what it mean, this is one of the aspects of what it means to be a Catholic person in the world today. We don't browbeat people or humiliate them or anything of this type, but we do need to speak, and we need to speak up, and we need to live the truth also. That marriage is one of the sacred things that has been uh, very, uh, very much disrespected by very many people in our society today. And the reason for it is because many people don't respect God anymore. And when we lose our respect for God, we lose our respect for life, for marriage, for the complementarity of the sexes, for many, many things. We need God. Some people think that religion is the big problem behind all of the evils in the world. Don't believe it. I mean, yes, there are always bad examples. There are people who will use religion for bad ends. But true religion respects the true God and His will. And true religion is the religion that Jesus came to reveal to us. So we have to be confident that our faith is not just one flavor and among a whole uh, variety of things and we can pick whatever we want. I mean, our, our Lord, there's only one God. He sent His Son. We know who the Son is. We know what He teaches. We know what He stands for. We know what the plan of salvation is. We know that we only have so, so long to live in this world. All of these things that we should never take for granted. It's a great blessing to be born, to be conceived, to be present in the world today. It is a great blessing to have faith, but we need to use these gifts to glorify God.